All right. Uh, we're talking in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans about Paul's uh, therefore life. Uh, and it's, uh, it is such an important concept that I'm going to uh, emphasize it again. In all of Paul's letters, he starts with a discussion of what we, for lack of a better term, we will call theological issues that are important to the church that he's writing to. It can either be complimenting them for it, like Philippians, or it can be highly negative, like 1 Corinthians. But he does that. Then somewhere along, usually uh, two, about two-thirds of the way through the letter, he will start a chapter that says, therefore. And what follows is the practical application of what he has taught to life. And that, that is really as important as the theological part of the book. People read his theology, the part of it, and are gung-ho about it. But they many times, when they get to the therefore, uh, they, they don't see it as, as is important and as binding on people's behavior as the theological part. Would this be true in almost all of his writings? I think every one, except Philemon. Mm -hmm. Although there is, there he mixes the theological and the personal. Uh, Philemon is a very personal letter. Okay, that's where we are. And he's been telling them, and he tells uh, the consequences for various people. Now, one of the important things is that for the Apostle Paul, the so-called, what we call ecclesiology, that's teaching about the nature and function of the church, is one of the central themes of his ministry. He called churches into existence. And he saw the church as a vital part of God's plan for the world. It's, it's not uh, under the influence of uh, uh, Protestant individualism with its <laughs> emphasis on personal salvation. Uh, we have lost that. Oak Hills and I am so happy, has regained that emphasis. We exist in order to be the living presence of Christ in every neighborhood of, in San Antonio and beyond. Now that's one, of, that's one of our basic purpose statements. And that's Pauline to the core. And I'm very happy to, to emphasize that, that it's the church as a corporate body. And Paul's emphasis on the unity of the church is, is important. Because for him, the church within its, to every person, every race and all that was a vital part of the gospel of salvation, that it's based upon the promise that God made to Abraham when he said, I will make of your people a great nation and all the nations of the world will be blessed by your descendants. Usually translated seed, but Zerah, the Hebrew word, is seed all right, but it means 
family. And so there, and Paul says there is now only one family of God that includes every person of every kind, every nation, every uh, race, every color, uh, all in harmony with one another. And we're going to really see that practicality when we get over to the 14th chapter. I can't wait to get over there. But here we are. Uh, he said, uh, we finished the 13th verse of chapter 12. He said, share your means with needy saints. Show hospitality to traveling missionaries. Ask God to bless those that are persecuting you. Now, this comes directly, almost a direct quotation from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Jesus says, pray for those that are persecuting you. And he says what? Ask God to bless. Now, I put it this way because I wanted to emphasize that this is you pray for positive things. And I think is if I can remember correctly, but it's been a while since I translated this, I think it just says, bless those that persecute you. But the subject of the word bless, every case that I know of it, except when it's obvious, you know, when Paul says, I'm, I'm blessed, but even in those introductions, the subject of the verb to bless is almost always God. Uh, He's the only one that really can. What, yes, and, but uh, whoever did my Matthew uh, translation will know that I'm, I put that in, in where it says, blessed are the peacemakers. I say God will bless because that is the way the Jews looked at it. Uh, Jesse, I like your statement. He actually he is the only person who can bless in the sense that uh, Jesus was talking about. And so uh, I've if shared. We, if we bless somebody, it's in in a sense in the name of Jesus. Yes. Just like when when you know Peter said, we can't do anything, but in in, in God he can do this. In Jesus' name we can do this. Yeah. Uh, if, always think about the old southern especially southern women would say bless his little heart <laughs> which sometimes is not well bless her yes uh, yeah <laughs> it it that's usually kind of uh negative yes. yeah it, it means that, like uh brother marshall keeble used to say if if you can't understand what a passage means is that you don't have to worry. It says you can get to heaven on an idiot ticket. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's what, bless his little heart, you, say, you, you know, you can't expect any better out of them. <laughs> but uh, I heard a, a program on words from the public radio station. A couple, about a month ago on Wednesday night because they would have this program on about using words and where Life. phrases came from uh, and they were they mentioned this phrase this southern <laughs> phrase bless his little heart or her little heart and that's not what it means here it means that you ask God to do to tend to their well-being. That's just a definition of love. You commit to the well-being of any of everybody, regardless of how you happen to feel about them. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, they haven't done you wrong. 
One thing I always had to get people's idea about forgiving people that have wronged you. You do not say that when you say, I forgive you, you do not say, well, you didn't hurt me. That's not what, that's not what forgiveness means. Forgiveness says, you hurt me and maybe terribly but I am going to start living as if you hadn't. Mm -hmm. See, that's what God says mm -hmm. to us when he forgives us. He doesn't say we haven't sinned. Mm -hmm. He said, you have sinned mm -hmm. grievously, but I'm going to start treating you as if you have not. Now, does that, does that clarify the idea? And that's the idea of blessing those that persecute you. You ask God to bless them. God to do what's for their best interest. Uh, I, I've used the example of a couple that wounded mine and me. We had been so close and they got uh, some false information about what Oak Hill stood for and some th other things and they just cut us out of their lives. They wouldn't answer any letter we, uh, or uh, emails or anything. And it hurt. I'm going to tell you it hurt. It stung because we've been in each other's homes. We've done everything. So I, I, my attitude toward them wasn't too good. And I realized that it was souring me and hurting me. So I started praying regularly, and things have gotten much better when I did that. At least from my viewpoint, the, 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 the division between us is not there, and it's much better from theirs. So do that. Ask God to bless those who, who are persecuting you. Yes, bless them and not curse. Now. In the Bible, curse doesn't mean using vulgar or filthy language. It means literally you call the curse of God upon them. Uh, and uh, when Peter said that when Peter denied Christ with a curse, he, his, uh, that's not what we mean by cursing. It means that he said, God as my witness, I don't know him. Or may God strike me down. Or, yeah, or, yes. <clears throat> he probably, if he was speaking Aramaic or Hebrew, said anathema, uh, which means may God curse them. Uh, it's the same cursing that happened when uh, uh, Joshua had the children of Israel six uh, tribes on one mountain and six on the other, mm -hmm. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and they, one group of them talked about the blessings that would come keeping the law, and the other group, the curses. Uh, it's very possible, and I translate this to bring it out, is may God cause bad things to you. And that's, uh, I do that in order that people will know exactly what the equivalent language is today. Would it be, may God cause or may God allow? Either one. I mean, it's a, it depends on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. but, but just as God is the subject of the word Baruch, to bless, he is also the subject of the uh, the woe or the curse. Uh, so, it, so see, it's, it's like the woes that Jesus spoke against the Pharisees. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, uh, rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and weep with those who are weeping. Now, this is a passage that's quoted a lot. And I'm not sure that people uh, get the full thrust of it. This means having compassion upon people. 
you, it means that you go alongside them and you try to feel what they are feeling. Now, this is something that uh, I learned from counseling. Do not tell somebody, I know what you're going through unless you have experienced it yourself. You can say, I know it must be terrible. But that's, you can do that. And, but but it, don't, don't tell people, I know what you're going through unless you really do. Isn't that the difference between sympathy and empathy? Uh, empathy again, well, again. sympathy can be condescending. I feel your pain. Uh, what? I feel your pain. Yeah, no, and empathy, though, you have. You have a, the appropriate feeling. No, notice, weeping with those that weep. Uh, now, as, as I say, be careful there because I have had people that I counseled that would tell me, I remember a young woman whose husband uh, was killed. He was a, a highway worker and somebody didn't pay attention to the worker sign and he was killed and she said I get so angry at the women at church and I said oh why she said well they come to me and say I know what you're going through and he says they've got their husbands and their family and everything around them they don't know and so that's that's the clue but as much as you can share their feelings. Don't go laughing into a house of mourning. Don't go weeping to a wedding. <laughs> I'm just trying to get very practical here. And see, Paul says, be a human being among other human beings. Place yourself in their position and treat them accordingly. Uh, it's, it's really, we're sometimes like bulls in china shops. We, we act inappropriately. Uh, and that's, that's not what Jesus did. Remember when Jesus went to a house of mourning? What did he do? He wept. In the so-called shortest verse in the Bible, two words, Jesus wept. John 11 something, I can't, 35 maybe. Uh, it, I, I believe that, that God gives us experiences in our life that will help us to minister to those particular situations where we can say, I do understand, I do know. Yes, and here, if you, if you do share a loss or, or a joy, uh, and I've got another one, pet peeve of mine, don't go to a woman who is miscarried and tell her, well, you can have other children. Are your children just like uh, some kind of manufactured product that you can substitute one for another? Use your, use your head and your heart, not just your tongue. Okay, going on. Rejoice, uh, let's see, live in harmony with one another. Now. This is a, a concept I've come to rather much later in life. I was raised where emphasis was on unity. But for unity, they meant identity. You had to believe exactly the same. And that's not what uh, Paul is emphasizing. It's harmony. In other words, 
harmony is uh, means that although there are some differences in outlook, in peripheral boundary matters and things like we've talked about before, basically you live harmoniously together. It's, it's the ideal family. If you have more than one child, you'll know that they're different. And uh, sometimes vastly different. Sometimes I wonder, you know, as, my, as our children were growing up, if we, somebody had replaced the child. <laughs> and they probably felt that way about their parents. Uh, it's, it's amazing how many children sometime in their life wonder if they're adopted. Uh, you, if, if you counsel, you'll find that that's true because they just can't believe that that's my mother and my father. But live in harmony with Harmony is something you can choose to do. Like love. Yes, like love. And that live in harmony with one another. Now, I took a, a real chance here, but I translated this uh, into the equivalent. Don't strive to be part of the upper classes. Now, this was one of the problems that divided the church in the first century. Was that, now Paul, as Paul points out in his first letter to the Corinthians, there weren't many of the upper classes in the churches, but there were some. Theophilus would have been a member of the upper class that Luke wrote his gospel and the Acts too, because he was had the title excellency. And that means that he he was well up in the ruling classes. Uh, and everybody then, just like now, wants to be part of the movers and the shakers. Uh, and, and so I thought I'd get it to where nobody could misunderstand what he's saying. Don't strive. Now, this doesn't mean if you were born into it, you, you have to quit being. It doesn't mean that it, if you have a, an opportunity to t be advanced, it means to strive means you give it all you got. Uh, you're ambitious. The only time I ever had a Bible class, and it was bigger than this one, that everybody in the class differed with what I said, it was one time when I said, I'm not particularly ambitious. And you would have thought that I had confessed to the, to the blackest sin uh, in, in the catalog of sins. They just wouldn't take that. Everybody's ambitious. Well, ambitious in that there's ambitious by just striving to do your best, and then there's stepping on people on the way up. Yeah, that's and right. And that's the difference. Well, that's right. Uh, ambitious to me means that that is a central theme of your life. Right. Now, a motivating force. Yeah, yeah it's that, a motivating force. Yeah, that's good. That see, that's because that's what a lot of people mean when they say ambitious. It means you. I mean, you're going to step on people. You're going exactly. to do whatever it takes, uh, and it it's assumed. Our whole social system is based upon pe be people being ambitious. They want to improve themselves. Now, if by improve you mean to learn more about God, or to serve God better, or uh, do something, that's, that's a horse of a different color. But just to, to, to seek to be uh, the next level of earthly or worldly importance. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yes. 
the Joneses are trying to keep up with you. Exactly. And, 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 and that, that makes for a pretty mixed up situation. Yeah. Uh, cycle. Well, so often, so often when one uh, tries to be so ambitious uh, about, say, biblical study, that brings on arrogance, and, and we forget to thank God for the gift it, of our mind, and we think, oh, we've accomplished yes, that. Yes, yes. We've gained yes. knowledge. See, thank you for sharing that. That's exact. See, we can even be ambitious for the right things. And, and yeah, I, I wanted always to be able to preach the best sermon that I was capable of preaching. But that's, that's different. Uh, because I knew that if I did, it was because I had submitted myself to God and His Word. It wasn't me. Uh, that it, it wasn't you trying to keep up with N.T. Wright. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'd like to sit at his feet. Uh, uh, found out something about him. If you just read his papers, you might think he was arrogant. But if you read about his relationships with other people, he's not. He's humble and, and he learns from people and he loves to serve people. And I think that's one of the reasons that God has uh, allowed him to dig so deeply into the meaning of New Testament text is that he he's as humble as a child. He's always ready to learn from anybody. But you better have something to say. <laughs> as I heard one time, he's one of those people that doesn't suffer fools easily. <laughs> and sometimes the, the British are noted for that. Uh, they would they uh, they uh, they just you know they look always think of this thing look down their long bony noses at you real well okay we'll go, don't strive to be part of the upper classes but be willing to associate with those of low estate now that's one of the major disruptive social Act things in the early church because in the same church there would be a few upper class but the majority of the church was made up of lower class and slaves even and I told you about the church out in California in uh, where the university in Berkeley uh, California where they had two elders this was years and years and years ago. One of them was the outstanding scholar of the classic literature. He was known the world over. His name was Green. I've read material from him. And the other was the janitor in the, were in the building where the, the other, Elder Green had his office. And people would say, you couldn't tell them apart when they worked with Christians in the church. Now that, if you want to see what Paul, what Paul means, live in harmony, don't <laughs> seek to be people of, see, uh, there's nothing higher in a university community than a tenured professor, professor who has a chair. You know, chairs are, are endowed by people with money and they're paid, the university doesn't pay them. The endowment pays them. And so they're, you talk about independent as a hog on ice. A, a, a tenured professor in occupying a chair. Where did that come from? Uh, I'm gonna tell you, you never heard it? Well, there's a book called Independent as Hard, Hog on Ice. It's by Charles Funk. Uh, his uncle was Funk of Funk and Wagnalls. And, uh, and he, he searched all over the world to find the source of that, and he never did. He, he, he still doesn't know. But it's, 
it's very common in the upper Midwest, or used to be. Now, why a hog? Why on ice? He could, he, he tried everybody's suggestion, but all the major libraries in the world. Winter rodeo. What? <laughs> Winter rodeo, like when this chase around the big, this one's on ice. Uh, uh, he never did. There's another one that he couldn't find, and that's uh, to, when it says pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Mm -hmm. He couldn't find what a bootstrap was. Oh. Now, it's not that thing that you pull huh. up. That's what everybody thinks, but it's not. That's called a boot loop. Mm -hmm. And he, that's two that he failed. Now, he's got the source of nearly every kind of saying you want, but he wrote three books on it. I, at one time, I had all three of them, but they were paperback. And uh. paperbacks, when they get about 50 years old, uh, <laughs> Uh, they they tend to fly away <laughs> in pieces. Okay. Uh, then he, it's almost as if he wants to to make everything very clear. Because then he says, "Don't be conceited." Uh, what what does it mean to you be, to be conceited? Think you're better than, yes? Think a lot of yourself. What? Think a lot of yourself. You think a lot of yourself. You think more better of yourself than the yeah. average person thinks of you. <laughs> That's your book there, Charles, Hog on Ice. It is, it is. yes it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> See? A Hog on Ice. Uh-huh. Uh, it is by Charles Funk. Yeah, it? it is. Yeah. I thought my memory was still 2002. Two, well, it the the first it, issue of it was much earlier than 2002. That must be the the, the a reprint or a, a, a revision of it. Anyway, let's get back here. Ah, so to be conceited is to think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Uh, now. Actually, Jesus' ideal for his followers is not to think about yourself at all. Now, that's a pretty high standard. I've, I've told you about C.S. Lewis, and, and he made a statement in a lecture one time that he didn't particularly like the Sermon on the Mount. And People were aghast. Mr. Lewis, you don't like the Sermon on the Mount? He said, why should I like something that every line of it condemns my behavior? <laughs> and I think, I think, he, I think he probably understood the Sermon on the Mount pretty well because the standards there were met only by one human being. Jesus himself. I don't know any other human being. In fact, I know that I don't know any other human being that has met all of them. And I don't think I have met any human being that has met the majority of the statements. Uh, and especially, I don't know anybody who has kept the spirit of all of them. So that's the standard. If you want to think well of yourself as a moral person, measure your morality by the Sermon on the Mount. And I think you will pretty well decide that you're, uh, I think if you do that honestly, your estimate of yourself will probably be close to what God's estimate is. If I get to feeling too good about myself, I can I, I remember some of the commands that Jesus states in the Sermon on the Mount. I think 
just don't be conceited. That's what made it so hard. The that new that new uh, way of thinking that that struck at the Pharisees and made it so hard for people to accept Jesus is that all of a sudden everyone was on a level playing field for all sinners and in need of saving. Yes. And. And that's the thing that people did not want to hear exactly. from Jesus. They, well, they, had, they had earned their they, they had earned their blessings from God by their hard work, by them keeping the law, well, by what they did. Okay, you know we we sometimes uh, actually uh, condemn the Pharisees for something they didn't do. Actually, their position was that they had been saved by grace because they were descendants of Abraham. Abraham was the one who was righteous. And they were saved by his righteousness. And then, then the idea was you got to keep the law in order to stay as a descendant of Abraham. And uh, that's, a, that's kind of the average Christian, I find, has been taught, you know, well, they thought they could save themselves by works. That's not exactly. They could, they needed to do keep the law completely so that they could be saved by the grace God gave to Abraham. And, uh, but, so the, Jesus came along and said, God loves everybody. Gentiles as well as Jews, circumcised as well as uns, and and then he said he pointed out that they did not even keep the law. You make you've nullified the law by some of your interpretations, and that they, they we're not going to stand hits for that. Okay, let's go on. Don't pay back e evil. Now, this is really hard. Uh, what is it? Don't get angry, get even? And if it was Old Testament, an eye for an eye. Well, uh, strangely enough, that was uh, uh, a step up from the surrounding Semitic people. If they, if somebody put out your eye, you had a, you could kill them. So uh, the Old Testament law said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. At least you didn't hurt them any worse than they hurt you. But Jesus says you have heard that, but I say to you something different in the Sermon on the Mount. So don't, be, don't. Pay back evil. Aim to do what is right in the sight of everyone. Now, this admonition can be uh, misused because uh, this does not mean that you try to please everybody. It means that you try to be good in everybody's sight. In other words, you do not please this group and not worry about other people. It's a hard idea to make practical. But in most cases, you can find a position that everybody would say, well, that's okay. That, that, that's good. So you try to do that. You don't select one party, you know, and over another one. You, you try to do good to everybody and be good for everybody. Not necessarily trying to convince everybody. That's right. But, uh, you know, Paul said, in another place when he was uh, 
collecting the money for the saints in, in Judea that were hungry. He told them he wanted to do what was right in the sight of everybody. And so he wanted the people to send a representative with their gift so that they would know that he didn't misuse it. Now that's a practical thing. See, there's doing things that's right in the sight of everybody so that nobody could accuse him of, uh, of extortion. Do you know one thing that just makes me so angry about modern life is how many so-called charities pay little or nothing to the people that are suffering. I'm not going to use any names. I, I know some of them by name. Know one of them that less than a penny on the dollar goes to the people that they claim to serve. The 99 cents goes to the officials and the people that, that run the charity. The administration. What? Administrative, administrative costs. That's right. You read the paper this morning. No, I didn't. Oh, it was in the paper this morning. Well, well I did, I, yeah. I, no, I didn't even pick up the paper off the driveway this that's, morning. That's the article was in the paper. Well, there's a, there's a lot of them mm -hmm. that, that do that. Mm -hmm. So, okay. As much as it depends on you, and to the extent of your power, be at peace with everybody. Now, Paul is very careful here. He's saying, because he realizes that it only takes one side to make a, a, a quarrel. You cannot be at peace with some people. You can do everything Remember Jesus? He was the Prince of Peace. And yet, as we've already said, there were people who hated him so much that they railroaded him to death. They, they conspired against him. And he tried to be as much as he could at peace with everybody because he died for everybody. Even the Pharisees that he makes that long list of things that they did that was wrong in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, he loved them to death, literally. So Paul, you know, people think that Paul somehow kind of corrupted the teachings of Christ, or many people do, but he didn't. You follow what he says, and you can find echoes of what Jesus taught. He, he builds a case point by point. It's, it's the, the, you know, don't repay evil for evil. Mm -hmm. he, he preempts that by saying, don't be conceited first. Mm -hmm. And says, then the next step is you, you can do this. And mm -hmm. the next step is that, you know, he, he's showing us how, step by step how to be like them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, going on. You whom I love should never take revenge on take revenge on those who wrong you, but leave the field open for God's angel to work in accord with what is written. Revenge belongs to me alone, says the Lord. I will avenge the wrong done to you. Now this is a promise. Every wrong that somebody does to you, God will take care of. Now that doesn't mean that he'll do it when you want it done necessarily. It doesn't mean that he will stop trying to get them to repent and change and do better. It means that he takes under advisement the wrongs done to you. In fact, one way of looking at the book of Revelation is God's promise 
to the late first century church that every drop of blood they shed would be avenged by God. He would use even the things in creation, the waters, the sea, earthquakes, famines, war, pestilence. He would use catastrophes. He would make sure that the blood of the martyrs would be avenged. You're more than conquerors through him that loved you. That, that as I say, that's, that's one way. There's much more to the book of Revelation than that. But that's one of the promises. And so know this. God will take care of all those who harm, who say bad things, who slander, who even kill you. You don't, it's not up to you. And Paul was very, and Paul was one who probably within what, seven, eight years, something like that, maybe as much as nine, after this, was beheaded in Rome. His enemies finally got the better of him, only they didn't. It only, as he says to the Philippians, better for me to die and go be with my Lord than it is for me to continue to live. I'm in, I'm betwixt and between. I'm torn whether I want to depart this life or go on with as much suffering as I'm having. He said, for you it's better for me to stay alive. For me, it's better to die. And not a whole lot longer after that, he did die. And yet he never sought vengeance on the people that opposed him. He might decide that John Mark wasn't dependable and not use him in missionary work but we know from the book of second timothy that he and john mark got back together again before paul died his whole life is an example of these teachings now it didn't mean paul didn't have faults Paul was not an easy man to live with. <clears throat> I can understand John Marks uh, not wanting to. You take a person as committed as Paul, they're not comfortable to be around. Even as loving, and he wrote the greatest hymn to love that's ever been written but he still wouldn't be an easy person to be around. And that's time for us to close.